Hi there, welcome back to my channel. If you're a returning subscriber, I'm so happy you're here. And if you're brand new to my channel, I just wanna let you know that this is not typical with my videos. My other videos on my channel are very different than this one, having to do with Christianity and Mormon topics. But this one is just a fun new one. I thought it was really important and I wanted to put it on my channel because this week I had the opportunity yet again to meet with Mormon missionaries because they came and knocked on my door several nights ago. This is not the first time that Mormon missionaries have knocked on my door. Back in September of 2018, we had some young men from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints knock on our door and want to share the message with me and my husband. So we gladly invited them in so that we could discuss spiritual topics, Mormonism, as well as Christianity. A little background scoop on us. We are biblical Christians, born again uh, sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith in him. We are very grounded in our faith and we did not feel as though maybe Mormonism was true. So let's invite them in so that we can, um, you know, potentially be converted to Mormonism. But we invited them in to, obviously to discuss our faiths and to test Mormonism against biblical Christianity, but ultimately to share the true biblical Jesus with these young men who we cared about so deeply and who honestly became friends of ours. We grew to love them and it was a wonderful experience. We met with them for several months and we met with them multiple times a week. We invited them over repeatedly. My husband and I were just so excited to dive in and learn Mormonism in depth. We knew so very little about Mormonism at the beginning of all of it. And over those period of three months, it was like Mormonism crash course. Like we dove in and read the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price and Doctrine and Covenants. And we discussed with the missionaries literally every doctrinal topic you can possibly imagine. And they also brought people along from the different wards um, into the home to talk to us as well about their beliefs and to discuss it. We went to church with them, to their church. They also came to church with us. So I discuss more of that in my How to Witness to Mormon Missionaries video. But tonight's different. I wanted to talk about the fact that, well, not only this week did Mormon elders, two young men, come back to our house, but let me rewind for just a second as well. So back in January 2020, which was just over a year after we had stopped meeting with the first group of elders, two young sister missionaries knocked on my door. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see them and of course invited them in and met with them several times. They also brought other people along with them from the ward here locally um, just to discuss everything and to help them out. And anyway, I had a great relationship with them and I cared about them and we discussed so many things in our meetings. It was really, really cool kind of to do uh, meeting with the missionaries 2.0. Well, that happened and we ended up having to leave on a vacation at the end of January. And then those two ladies got transferred out of the area. So I didn't hear anything after that and really didn't expect to, but I felt really good about the meetings that I had with them. We discussed incredibly important topics and it went really well. So flash forward to now, May of 2020. Just several nights ago, two young men knocked on our door and I went to, the, went to the door. I could see them through the window with their white shirts and their name tags on. And I was, again, so pleasantly surprised that they were coming back. So I opened the door and said, hi, guys, how are you? And they said, hi, are you Jessica? And I was like, yeah, how do you know? And they said, oh, the two sister missionaries who were meeting with you told us about you and we're the new elders in town and we would love to continue meeting. And so I was like, absolutely, let's do it. And I called my husband over. He came to the door and we met each other and invited them to come back the following night. Well, I wanted to make this video because it was so very different this time around. Meeting with Mormon missionaries after you really have a knowledge and understanding of their belief and their scriptures and doctrine and their history and the prophets and Joseph Smith and all of it, it's so different than going into it knowing very little about the depth of the doctrine and history and all of that because we learned that along the way the first time around. 
And um, it, I wouldn't change a thing. It was just an incredible time in our lives. And honestly, those first elders who we met with for all of those months inspired my channel 100%. That's why I'm here. So that was just an incredible chapter in my life. But I will say that this time around, it was very cool to experience it on a totally different level of really having this, you know, depth of knowledge having to do with Mormonism. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that meeting and thought, hey, maybe this video could be really helpful to you if you are a biblical Christian actively witnessing to Mormons and inviting them into your home. Or if you are a Latter-day Saint watching this, you could maybe come to understand why our beliefs do differ so much and also why I care to share the message that I do over my channel and why I'm here. And if you're an ex-Mormon, my goal is always to help you on your um, path and your faith crisis, if you're going through one, um, to find the true biblical Jesus and just to find truth in your life so that you can come to a relationship with Jesus Christ and just have a peace and a joy and a comfort moving forward, knowing that you have found the truth. That's the goal of my channel. So let's discuss what went down in the meeting several nights ago with these new elders. Let me say one of them was actually trained by the elder that we met with way back in um, 2018, who we met with for those number of months and they knew one of the other elders who was also his partner. It was just, it's just really cool how everybody's still connected because it's only been, you know, less than two years at this point. Um, but anyway, this new elder, he said, oh, you know him? Wow, he trained me. And so it was just cool to have that personal connection and to be able to tell him stories about our past discussions and also to say, we love and care about that young man so very much. I'm still in contact with him to this day over social media. And anyway, it was just kind of cool to have that connection. And I totally believe God led these young men to our door. He, or, he has a personal relationship with the elder who my husband and I care about so much. So very cool how it all happened. So anyways, this time was very different. Um, my husband and I were very upfront um, from the very beginning. And we just told them, Hey, we want you guys to know that we are not brand new to your belief system. We know a whole lot about it. We know a lot about your history and doctrine and your scriptures and everything. So, um, yeah, we learned so much about it in the first months of meeting with the missionaries. And they were like, okay, no, that's great. And they're like, well, what did you guys want to talk about? What would be valuable for you to talk about tonight? So I just kind of started off by saying the most important thing, you know, we could get into so many different things, but the single most important thing is who is God and who is Jesus? Because Jesus is critical for eternal salvation, the eternal salvation of your soul. And so we got into who is God and it, it made for a really really interesting discussion both that night and in our text messages since then. So basically, I just wanted to get into, of course, you know, the King Follett sermon where Joseph Smith really talks about who the Mormon God is. He was once a man who was exalted into Godhood. And Joseph goes on to say that we too must learn to become gods ourselves. So God in Mormonism was a man from a past world. He was exalted into godhood through exaltation, and he became heavenly father of this world. And he was not eternally God because prior to, you know, becoming God, he was a man. And before he was born, he was a spirit child of his heavenly mother and father and he heavenly mo mother and father. <laughs> and so it was really cool because these two young men were totally upfront and honest about this whole thing and said, yep, that is definitely what we believe. And you, you got it basically. And so we were like, okay. 
And then I said, also, let's discuss the Latter-day Saint Jesus. Um, you can get into Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Abraham, chapters like three and four, and get into the fact that the LDS Jesus is older brothers to Lucifer, Satan, and he's older brothers to all of humanity. So Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother had Jesus as their firstborn, then Lucifer, and then the rest of us. So it's it's crucial to get into this because who God is, is everything. So I said, you know, we have the LDS God who is not eternally God. And you have this infinity of gods, really, because the hope of LDS men is to reach full exaltation into celestial kingdom and to become your own God one day over a future world where you then have spirit children and everything else. And even prior to that, you become a Messiah figure and then, you know, exalt into becoming a, a heavenly father figure. And again, the two young elders were totally upfront with all of this and said, yep, agreed. That's, that's what we believe. And so my husband and I were like, okay, well, we wanted to talk about who God is from the biblical Christian perspective. So we said that we absolutely believe in, in the Trinitarian God, the triune God of the Bible, one God uh, manifested through three persons, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so they wanted to get into that and said, well, how do you believe in the triune God. And so we're like, yeah, that's a great question. Let's get into that. So I said, you know, I really encourage you to read John chapter one, just to start. And, you know, we can go from there. Well, actually, let me back up a second. We did get into John chapter one, but I said, let's start with the very first chapter of the entire Bible. I was like, let's jump into Genesis one. <laughs> and let me open my Bible so I can read the actual verses. But I said in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, etc. Then you get into verse 27, the following verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And it goes on to say, and God blessed them and God said to them and it continues. So let me back up really quick. I started with verse 26. It distinctly says, let us create man in our image. Us is plural. So if this is God speaking, God is speaking plural. Let us create man in our image. So does that sound like multiple gods, like Mormonism teaches? Okay, it could, but then listen to this. Let us make man in our image. Image is singular. So us is plural, image is singular. It doesn't say let us make man in our images, plural. And then it continues right after that and says, so God created man in his own image. And it continues to say, God blessed them and God said to them. It doesn't say they blessed them and they said to them. So the gods created man in their own image. It says God. And so I think right there in the very beginning of the first book of the entire Bible, you can see so clearly just the example of the triune God of the Bible. And way back in Genesis 1, 1, the very first verse in the whole Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So there we have the Holy Spirit. And again, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Latter-day Saints believe that, yes, Jesus was the creator. God had Jesus create everything. And yet here we see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then let us create man in our image. Image singular. So this is a heavy subject, but it, it made for a very good discussion. And we kind of went all over through different scriptures. 
um, in the Bible as well as in the Book of Mormon. And then we got into John chapter 1. And in John chapter 1, 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word here is referring to Jesus. Uh, the Word is Jesus. And it distinctly says right there, the Word was God. Okay, now I want to get into verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So it's those who accept Jesus for salvation who become, gain the right to become the children of God, which shows that we were never literal children of heavenly father and mother of God, the way that Mormonism teaches. No, you become a child of the Almighty God, when you accept Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, you become a born again, new creation, new Christian, and then you are considered a child of the Almighty God. And that's really important to talk about because if we're going to be talking through all of these, you know, deep and also basic LDS theologies, we have to get into these specific points. And then of course, let's go back to verse three. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. So this is talking about Jesus. Nothing that was ever made was made without Jesus. All things were made through him. And he is from the very beginning of time, meaning eternally God, Jesus. And then I wanted to skip down a little bit further. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So the word became flesh to dwell among us. Jesus, the word, God became flesh to dwell among us. He took on flesh and Jesus literally personified God. Read a little bit further to in verse 18, we read, no one has seen God at any time. That's a very important verse when you're talking to a Latter-day Saint. No one has ever seen God ever. Read the entire Bi Bible and God is the unseen, invisible father He's the unknowable God of the Old Testament. And Jesus made the unknowable God of the Old Testament known. He literally personified God so that people could see him. And Jesus says in John and elsewhere, those who have seen me have seen the Father. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And to take that a little bit further, it says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Jesus has declared God. He made him known. So there's so much right there in John 1, 1 through 18 that was so important as far as, um, you know, the Bible's God, the biblical gospel versus the doctrine of Mormonism, the God of Mormonism. Huge distinction. And then on the same subject line, I took them over to um, Colossians. Let me check my notes so I get the verse right. Yes, Colossians 1.15. So speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. Like I was saying before, Jesus is the visual personification of the invisible God. Meaning, and God, God's a spirit. God is not of flesh and bones. I mean, we read in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then there's so many other passages where we could get into that. Uh, but even, you know, the passage, it's Numbers 23, 19, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man. God is a spirit. 
And um, here we see back in Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. And then verse 16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. So think about that for a second. That is saying that nothing in existence is here without Jesus creating it. And everything that was created in heaven, on earth, invisible, visible. And then it goes further to say thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He's before all things. He came before all things. And in him, all things consist. So this includes the powers and principalities. That includes Lucifer. That includes the demonic realm, the angelic realm, all of it. So Jesus is not Lucifer's big brother. Jesus is Lucifer's creator. And that is a very important concept because this just destroys the doctrine of Mormonism. And I want to say that if you need to take this concept even further, and I didn't this time around meeting with these missionaries, but I actually did bring it up meeting with the sister missionary several months ago, where the book of Abraham that talks about the gods, multiple gods, you don't find that in the book of Mormon anywhere, by the way. And that was covered in my last a couple of videos that I put up where, you know, the Book of Mormon actually treats, uh, teaches Trinitarian concepts. It also teaches modelism, which is, um, it's a heretical teaching in regard to the Trinity. But yeah, it does not teach multiple gods. And so if you get into the Book of Abraham that does teach multiple gods, well, then let's talk about that Mormon scripture for a second. The book of Abraham is a false translation and it's really a disaster when it comes to Mormon scripture. You can pull it up on the church's official website, Book of Abraham, and you can read in the Gospel Topics essays how it is a false translation. Joseph Smith took papyri and he translated it into the book of Abraham, what we read in the Pearl of Great Price scripture. Um, And this is where you're going to read about Jesus being Lucifer's big brother and all of that, right? So the book of Abraham, can it be trusted? Well, if that's going to be used as scripture to prove, you know, these concepts, you need to go back and say, well, the book of Abraham cannot be trusted at all because we know now today that the words and phrases contained on that papyri that Joseph supposedly translated is nothing more than an Egyptian burial ritual called the Book of the Dead. And everything that he translated into the Book of Abraham is from his own imagination. It is not from that papyri. And I have an entire video on that so you can get further in depth and really study that out. And like I said, you can read it right on the church's official website under, you know, the gospel topics essays, the book of Abraham translation. And you can see that nothing contained in the book of Abraham is actually contained on the papyri. So that's a huge problem. Um, Other sects of Mormonism have totally thrown it out. It's not their canonized scripture anymore. And the LDS church has kept it. Why? I have no idea because, well, I guess I do have an idea. Obviously, they need it uh, for doctrine like what I was talking about before, but it's quite easy to disprove. And if you need to go there, I think it's valuable to go there. But anyways, back to the meeting that we had this week. Um, We got into all of that, which was um, excellent. And then we also talked about prophets. We were talking about how the Bible contains prophecies in the Old Testament that were recorded with extreme detail uh, thousands of years, you know, hundreds to thousands of years before any of the New Testament books had ever been written. So all of the books in the Old Testament that are containing these incredibly detailed prophecies, we find them fulfilled in the New Testament hundreds to thousands of years later. And it's not just 
one prophecy or five prophecies or 10 prophecies. It's hundreds of prophecies and they are all fulfilled to an unbelievable detail. And I'm going to link um, below in the description. So go check it out the description right below this video. Um, a link to this incredible resource where you can see the biblical prophecies fulfilled from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And it also talks about how for all of those things to come to be and to be fulfilled, there is absolutely no way that a man could have written this book. It is of divine origin. This is God-breathed scripture. And if the prophecies aren't enough for you to realize that, where a book or two books, I should say, the Old Testament and the New Testament literally self-authenticate and fulfill one another to that extreme detail. If that's not enough to convince you, I don't know what is, but there's so much more than that, um, but it's just an incredible study. So we got into that with the elders as well. And um, we started talking about prophecies and prophets, right? And um, they were talking about Joseph Smith and they said, well, you know, Joseph Smith, prophesied multiple times and, you know, that actually happened. So obviously he's a prophet. And so um, a question was, okay, what did, what did Joseph Smith prophesy? And um, one of the things that Latter-day Saints like to go to a lot is that he prophesied the American Civil War and Doctrine and Covenants 87, where he, you know, supposedly prophesied the Civil War. Well, you got to think of the timeline here. The Civil War happened in the late 1800s. Joseph Smith, you know, started Mormonism in the early to mid 1800s. And it was quite evident to see that, you know, war was brewing and there was slavery going on. And um, they had the complications and, you know, war brewing between the North and the South and all of that. So when you read DNC 87, no, it's not a prophecy about the American Civil War. It, he, Joseph Smith took it way further than that, where he said that it will result in an end of all nations. And there would be famine, plague, thunder, lightning, earthquakes. And it's just, it's so far-fetched. And of course, that never happened. And the American Civil War was isolated. It was American. And no, it did not result in an end of all nations, nor did we see earthquakes and thunder and lightning and um you know, famine and plagues and all the other things. So we did bring that up. And it was interesting because the young men, they weren't familiar with that passage in DNC 87. They actually had never even read it before. And so when we read through it, um, his one of them, his defense was, he said, well, I believe that this is prophesying the Civil War. And then all this earthquake and all this other stuff, like that's prophesying towards World War One." And then when you finish off the chapter, it's kind of like back to the Civil War. But the end of all nations, that's like way in the future. And it was kind of like jumping all over the place. And we're like, well, you really do need to read this for what it is. And you can read it on the church's website. You can read the breakdown of what the chapter is about before you read it. And then you can read the entire chapter and see for yourself and see that that is a blatant false prophecy by Joseph Smith. And um, then, you know, we touched on just very briefly, you know, Deuteronomy in the Bible, the test for a true prophet, Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, and then also Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, where it says, you know, if a prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord and those things don't come true, it says he's to be a curse. It said he's to be killed and they're not a true prophet of God. And so... We got a little bit into that and it was just, it was fun this time along to really know LDS scripture as well as, you know, my Bible and to be able to just really discuss this stuff and, you know, when certain topics come up to be able to have like a response to it and a defense, you know, against it and stuff. So anyway, it was just like a really interesting week. And I have to say it was a night and day difference in the sense that going into a meeting with LDS missionaries, when you really know Mormonism versus going into a meeting with LDS missionaries, when you 
don't know the depth of their doctrine and beliefs and history and uh, their scripture and everything else, it is just a completely different situation. And I just want to encourage anybody who is actively witnessing to Mormons, get out Doctrine and Covenants and get out Pearl of Great Price and really read them and study them and start to get to know that scripture and familiarize yourself with it. Because they'll, of course, come with the Book of Mormon. And, you know, the Book of Mormon, it's it doesn't contain any of that stuff I told you about. So it's very, it, it comes across as kind of harmless. And, you know, you read through it and you think like, yeah, this contains, you know, different things than the Bible as far as the Nephites and everything in the ancient Americas and all that. But at the same time, it's still teaching a concept of God that Christianity would, for the most part, agree with, like Moroni 8.18 or, you know, 2 Nephi, I believe it's 31.21, and so, so many others um, where it's talking about, you know, eternal God, unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity, which is in con- a big conflict with the King Follett discourse and the actual doctrine of the Mormon God. And then I wanted to just bring up a couple of random things where the elders, after discussing a lot of this, they were like, well, you know that the Book of Mormon is actually found in the Bible. And we were like, oh, yeah, where is it found? And, you know, they brought out the passage in the Old Testament. And I, prior to making this video, didn't look it up and I should have. I will correct this in the description below so you can see the passage I'm talking about. But it's in the Old Testament um, in regard to the two sticks. And Mormonism believes like one stick is, you know, the Bible and one is the Book of Mormon, where in reality, it's two separate geographical locations, the north and the south. And you, if you read through the passage, that's very evident. I just looked it up and it's Ezekiel 37, 17 through 27. And then they brought up the other one in the New Testament where um, it talks about the other sheep in... John, again, I didn't write down the reference prior to filming, and it's not fresh in my mind because I have so much going through my mind, but in the New Testament where Jesus is referring to the other sheep that he needs to bring the message to. And of course, if you read that in context and in full and you know what's going on, you know, Jesus is talking to Jews. He's talking about dispersing the gospel to the Gentiles. He's not talking about going to the Americas to talk to, you know, the the Book of Mormon people. And I just looked this up and Jesus talking about the other sheep is found in John chapter 10, verse 16. The elders felt shut down and a little bit frustrated with that. They're like, yeah, we've heard a lot of Christians say that it's the Gentiles. And, you know, I feel like they kind of felt like, oh no, like we don't have a good way to really defend this like no this is absolutely speaking about the book of mormon um so then we just kind of changed the subject and of course it ended with them saying ultimately they're like you know you really just have to pray and ask if you know mormonism is true if the book of mormon is true and they you know talked about moroni 10 3 through 4 and said um you know that's the passage that talks about you you basically pray and ask in with sincerity and you'll get the burning in your bosom to show that it's true. And then they also said, you know, James 1, 5, it says the same thing. And that's in the Bible where you should really pray and ask if it's true and ask if the Book of Mormon actually is the truth and you'll get an answer. And, you know, our response to that was, well, actually, you know, James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, pray and ask God who gives it liberally. And if you're praying God and asking for wisdom, you are asking, you want to be wise. Wisdom is knowledge. Wisdom is discernment. It has literally nothing to do with praying and asking if something is true. You're asking God for wisdom. And if you're asking God for wisdom, like James 1, 5 really says, you will read things with wisdom and discern and see what they truly say. And you'll use the sound mind that God gave you. So again, that was, um, it was just kind of fun to to know that they were going to go to those passages. And, you know, it's it's the go-to James 1, 5, you know, to pray and ask if it's true. But that's not what James 1, 5 says at all. So anyway, it was just a really good meeting. 
And we were so respectful to one another, all four of us, the entire time. It was a great dialogue between us. It was very interesting. We covered a whole lot of subjects, a lot of topics, a lot of scripture. And um, I just wanted to share it on here. I thought maybe it would help you and give you a little insight on how I approach conversation with the Mormon missionaries. And that's how it went this time. And honestly, every single time I talk to the missionaries, it's different. It depends on the people. It depends on how receptive they are and their attitude and what, you know, information they're bringing to the table and what they want to discuss. And so it's just always different. But this time I just definitely felt like God was um, leading the discussion and it was productive and we've been texting since then and we'll see if they're um, willing and interested in getting together again. But either way, you just really need to um, be the light and exemplify who God is and love these precious young people, love them and share truth with them, invite them to talk to you because if they don't come across Christians, um, they're going to come across either a lot of rejection or they're going to come across uh, people who don't know Christ and they can't help them find the truth and they won't lead them out of Mormonism. And Mormonism is just a huge distortion. It's pseudo-Christianity. It's a distortion of the truth. It's not teaching the God of the Bible. And if you have God wrong, you have everything wrong. And that was basically the main point kind of driven home throughout our discussions with these two young men. But anyway, um, that's, that's what I wanted to share in this video. And I hope that it was helpful for you. And again, if you're new to my channel, please check out the rest of my channel. It's very different than this video. I go into um, LDS history and doctrine and scripture and prophets and uh, past events and just so much. It's, it's been really fun having this channel and going through all these different topics. And I have a lot more to come, but um, I thought this was a cool one because I had met with the missionaries just this week. And so hopefully I'll have more to share in future discussions with more missionaries. I'm really glad that they keep coming back to our home. It's been a huge blessing in our lives. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. God bless.